Welcome to another Military History Verbalize podcast. And today we have Justin again as guest, who is a master in military history. Welcome, Justin. Hello, everybody. And today we will talk about turning points or the lack of thereof, because there's quite some debate and very different opinions on what is considered the turning point. A lot of people usually throw in Stalingrad, for instance, where many historians lately, I think, basically state, well, it was not that much of a turning point, or it depends on which level, because you could say, was it a strategic turning point or a psychological one? So let's start off with Justin. What is your general view on this topic? Well, turning points are, are always an, an interesting um, debate, because there's some military historians who actually just kind of reject the concept of a turning point. Um, like, for example, um, I don't know if he necessarily rejects it, but Cetino, or Cetino, you know, um, he explicitly goes uh, in his books, he avoids using the term turning point, for example. Like, he, he doesn't seem to um, want to go that route, explaining um, how wars kind of, how the uh, fortunes of war kind of change. And then there's been plenty of books written where the central thesis of the book is like this battle was the turning point for something. So for, you know, lots of Stalingrad books have been like that, um, like the um, historian John Erickson, whose books I haven't read, but I mean, his, he, he wrote a two volume history of the Eastern Front and one was from, um, I can't remember the titles exactly. It was like from something to Stalingrad and then from Stalingrad to Berlin. Like that's were the two volumes. And of course, by implication, he's stating kind of like, Stalingrad was a turning point of sorts. In the Pacific, of course, the Battle of Midway is often talked about kind of as a turning point, although that has changed. Um, and then there's some people that just, again, don't consider turning points as something they really want to consider. So it's a very complex debate. And I mean, as a uh, way back in my undergrad days, I wrote lots of term papers about such and such battle was a turning point because it was a pretty, it was a very straightforward, you know, argument that an undergrad could effectively argue in the very limited space they had, you know, it was very straightforward and simple. So of course I did that a lot, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it can be a useful launching off point too, to start, you know, for example, somebody might indicate or it might uh, start engaging with such and such battle as a turning point, but then they use it kind of as a jumping off point to start other arguments or discussions. Yeah. So it's a very complex um, uh, I mean, thing. I mean, for me, if there's a turning point in the Pacific in the Second World War, it would be Pearl Harbor. Okay, yeah, see, th then you could even argue that. Because but, the war started against the United States and the Japanese already started rationing before the war against the, the, the U.S. forces. And, and so, and if you look at the, uh, at the overall output of the production of the industry of the Japanese and the U.S., it's, 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 it's a staggering difference. It's, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. And of course, I mean, if you, can... you also you look at, at the whole picture that the Japanese were already, already fighting a war for several years against the Chinese, and this for a long time still was their main focus of the war, at least for the army. Exactly. Like, um, you could even make that argument. You say, well, if you consider the war for the Japanese starting in 1937 or 1931, and you look, then at that point, you look at the US entering the war, you could very effectively argue that was a turning point for the war. And again, it, it compares to like, you know, for example, how you define, and uh, this is kind of important if any of you are going to be writing papers about this, is you need to define what you are saying the turning point is. So, because turning point, you can, like, or do you mean, like, when the when one side gained the strategic initiative? Or when you, you, in your opinion, you consider one side could no longer win the war? Or, you know, for example, so you really have to, to define the term turning point, uh, which is something that I think a lot of people, I mean, even me in undergrad, I never bothered defining it, which I got dinged on. Because I was just taught, I think uh, it was one paper in like my second year of undergrad or something where I was arguing Kursk is the turning point of um, the Eastern oh. Front, which I don't <laughs> think so anymore. But, uh, you know, back dumb undergrad, Justin, I, that was my argument. So whatever. Okay, that was my argument. But um, the, the, rightfully, the person marking the paper was like, well, by what standard? 
So, yeah. for example, I was pushing the I was pushing that it was when the Germans lost the strategic initiative, which already is debatable. But you know, I can yeah, go back. They already there. lost back then. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I was. That's what I was arguing. But then he's like, okay, well, that's one by one metric by them. So if he agrees, if I agree with your argument, then by one metric, the the, uh, the strategic initiative passed to the Soviets after the Battle of Kursk. How was that a turning point? Because I hadn't adequately defined turning point, and then of course he was. So, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is the point. If you focus enough, or if you you define it clearly enough, for instance, I think Kursk was a turning point on the psychological side, because for the Ger for the Germans in this case, yeah, because psychological side, you also need to determine, you need to see for which side as well. So, turning point on which level for which side, and maybe other criteria because. Kursk was the first summer offensive the Germans conducted against the Soviets which failed during the summer because Barbarossa and Case Blue both were mainly successful in the summer but failed late at, in fall or definitely in winter and there was always the counterattack. Whereas Kursk was already in summer, it was not effective. So at this point even the regular infantryman sees, okay, um, we are not winning against the Soviets anymore. Because before, and you could say, oh, we reached Stalingrad, oh, we, we were almost close to Moscow. And now they attack on a very limited space and they, they have to give up. They have to pull out because Hitler pulls back the divisions due to the invasion in Sicily. And yeah, so, so there's lots of, lots of factors there. Like, for example... Um, one of the uh, relatively new, but I guess it's a few years old now, um, called Islands of Destiny by John Prados. He talks about uh, the, Guadal the Solomon Islands campaigns, which now tends to be what people kind of call a turning point in the Pacific because Midway kind of started it, but it was the Solomons that really chewed up particularly the uh, air power of the Japanese, the, both army and navy. And also, uh, surface ship losses for the Japanese were also extremely high. So the, the so they kind of view that as at least at the very least turning point uh, as far as the air war goes, because when they entered the uh, Solomon uh, Islands campaign, the Japanese air services were still pretty much you know extremely powerful, and then by the end of it, they were almost impotent. Not completely, but they had been really ground down by the campaign there. So historians have kind of looked at that and explained through. So now you're talking about, instead of a single battle being a turning point, you're talking about a whole campaign spanning, um, oh, now I have to remember exact dates. I think it's about a year. Um, look what kind of PTO historian am I? But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, it was several months to a year. And that kind of hard campaigning bled the Japanese air services white. And from then on, it was very clear that the air war had swung decisively in favor of the allies. Yeah, but then you have a problem with the general term because then it's a turning line and not a turning point anymore because a point is... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so that's like point is rather focused on, on one particular element. I mean, you could say a battle takes longer, but it's still at least focused usually on one location whereas if you talk about this it's it's getting a bit hard if you talk about the whole solomon islands campaign and the duration it's a pretty exactly. large spot on the on the on the temporal and on the geographic uh space yeah, that is very true so you start problematizing the very concept of a turning point because then it's like well then what does that make midway because Midway, okay, so if I concede that Midway wasn't a hard turning point, I mean, obviously it gave the, the Americans the strategic initiative. It would also um, think a psychological turning point. Yeah, you could even say a, a psychological turning point. The loss of four fleet carriers was something that the Japanese were just not going to replace in any adequate period of time. In fact, I think it, was in, it, didn't, it took them until, I think, 40 late 44 or something like that, I think, before they'd replace the losses, or mid-44, can't remember exactly. Yeah, it's about that. But, so, so it's like, you know, but at the end of the day, they, they didn't actually lose that many pilots, not an inconsequential amount, but they lost some, nowhere close to what they would end up losing in the Solomons. But it's like, okay, well, maybe is that the start? But then when you're talking about an end point in 1943 somewhere, 
it, it's so it's that's a huge chunk of the war and it's like well of course at that point you're just talking about general attrition in which case i would argue well yeah that's kind of the point in that they wore the japanese out over a protracted campaign of attrition where the americans could sustain the losses and the japanese couldn't but yeah the, the, so the concept of a turning point can get very contentious very quickly of course yeah and of I mean, course you could stretch this over to the eastern front where there's a, I think a far more um, lively debate around turning points because that's been going on for decades because of course it kind of started and I mean I'll, I'll let you talk about that a little bit so I mean for me the the Eastern Front um, one of the most convincing um, documents or basically um, reproductive document I saw was I think it was from the German High Command um, the readiness rating for summer 1941 and summer 1942 where they determine I think there are four categories of division, um, capable of doing offensive and defensive operation, capable of doing li limited uh, offensive operations and defensive operations, capable of doing defensive operations and capable of doing limited defensive operations. And for 1941, it was like more than 100, I think, in the, in the highest category. And for 1942, it was like 12 or 20 or just... Uh, you look at the the graph in my in my video, which I will link in the description. It's like, what? And and this was their own determination. Like, okay, we only have a handful of divisions that are capable of full offensive capabilities after one year of war. And then then you say, okay, well, the turning point was Barbarossa. But again, it's not it's it's not a point because it's 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 the whole complete summer and winter of 1941. What I found and I think is probably uh, a turning point in was in the Battle of the Atlantic, because there you have the the one of the uh, the, the main um, the success of the U-boat waffle was immediately followed by a huge success by the anti uh, anti submarine warfare. So in January to March 1943, I think in March 1943 or April, the losses were the highest for the merchant fleet, for the Arab merchant fleet. And then in May 1943, the U-boat Waffe lost, I think, 41 or 47 U-boats in one month, which was the highest amount ever. And basically, shortly afterwards, doing its course back the U-boats from the Atlantic and says, okay, we, we are just bleeding dry, that doesn't work. So, but Milner states in his book of the Battle of the Atlantic that basically some historians at this point stop reporting on the battle in the Atlantic, basically, because it They consider it, I guess, almost over, even though it was still going. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, I mean it was still going on and there there was some back and forth. But basically, if you look at this point, like the highest losses in Allied shipping, and then shortly afterwards, the highest losses in, in U-boats. Mm -hmm. It's it's like this is probably where, where you have both extremes at once. So due to this concentration of of successes on both sides, I think here you could make the best argument that it was a turning point. Of course, in mm -hmm. both cases, it's due to the various changes that happen on the technology side, on the training side. On, on covering the air gap, on making um, airplanes more lethal to submarines and everything else. So what is your take on this one? Yeah, see, that, that's, that can be a very effective argument because you're seeing very hard evidence of a rapid or a significant change in the tides of the battle. So that, that's one where you could really make a very pretty much airtight almost argument. I mean, maybe somebody years down the line will come down and try and figure out another way of looking at it but you know when you're looking at like an overall war where things can get a lot more fuzzy uh that's where a, a real struggle can come in like for example i don't know um the war in china which people don't talk about very often um, and one engagement where i kind of brushed over when we did that uh, live stream because i was stupid and forgot about it but um the the battle for wuhan that entire campaign the the central objective for the japanese was actually to basically do exactly what you do as japan and hearts of iron where you try to uh encircle as much of the uh chinese army kind of along the coast and everything as you can so that when you move into the interior you're not fighting a, a giant army but um what ended up happening was the japanese ultimately failed in that objective and that 
the Chinese military for the most part was able to withdraw into the interior. And of course, you could argue at that point, the Japanese have really lost their ability to win the war quickly. And since the Japanese are not really ideally suited to fight a war for all eternity, they really um, kind of lost their ability. You could argue that's a turning point for the war in China. However, there's lots of ways you could look at it where it's like, well, but then what about the Asia Pacific war in general? Because you weren't operating in a vacuum. I mean, the Japanese would also eventually end up fighting the Americans and the British and all this kind of stuff. So it's like, was that really a turning point so much when you're looking down the line and you see all of these other certain setbacks, certainly the complete uh, political strategic disaster of bringing the Western allies into the war in the first place. So yeah, like, yeah it, it's, it's something that where it can be very um, vigorously debated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, here's also the point. I mean, China isn't particularly small. And even if they would have gathered the, or encircled the whole armed forces there, I'm pretty sure there were some other areas in China where they recruited new troops and, and raised new armies and some would have, have gone through. So, And that's exactly it. Yeah, it's like, cause then, because then the implication, if you're making that turning point argument is... You're assuming the Japanese would have been able to rapidly push inland and force them to capitulate. And that after that, there wouldn't have been a long-term you know, insurgency or something of that sort. So it's a, a lot of assumptions and you can start poking holes in it almost immediately. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> it, is, it, is, it assumes that basically what usually happens in Hearts of Iron, that the enemy gives up at a certain point, which in yeah. real life is not always the case. I mean, in, it, yes, very true. It, it, it was... For instance, in, in Europe in 1939 and 1940, I mean, the question is also, would the Polish probably would have fought way longer if the Soviets wouldn't have fallen all in their back? So at this point, they couldn't hold out any longer. But, mm -hmm. but other countries surrendered rather quickly, not, no, 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 not naming any names here. So... I don't think this would have happened in China, that they would have, okay, we give up and, yeah, occupy us. Mm -hmm. No, certainly. So and I'm sure there's, the, there's ter debates about turning points, I'm sure, in other wars as well. Um, I'm trying to think of, that's the thing, is I'm not super intimately well-read, of course, outside of kind of the interwar period and the Second World War, so I'm trying to think if there's another um, turning point. I guess uh, the Napoleonic Wars, I think some people, a lot of people talk about um, campaign in russia yeah this is also awesome. quite interesting because i read up on this already and if you mm -hmm. look at it because it's an argument which i will use in a, f a future video i have to still research it but if you look at um, napoleon's army in 1812 he was already at war for decades oh no not mm -hmm. decades at least a decade yeah he yeah. They lost already a lot of the best manpower and they were using a lot of of foreign troops as well at this point. And also his Imperial Guard, I think in 1812 was pretty bloated up already. So so this this which I outlined in my why was Napoleon so effective, that you can see that that it was not so much an elite troop more than it was basically a, another branch in the military. So the question is here with with what kind of army did he attack? at this point or what, how much sustainable was it still for France and everyone else at this point because the attrition rates were already quite substantial and of course basically you, you could argue of course um, this was the was this the final um, nail in the coffin or was it the first one yeah and that's exactly it because then you've also got the uh, Spanish ulcer going on and then you kind of get into this debate where it's like, well, how much was a draining off manpower from Napoleon? And he's, <laughs> it's like all of this stuff. And then, so I, again, there's so much room for debate, uh, which is something that probably a lot of people, that this might actually be kind of new to a lot of people where they kind of assumed like, oh, Battle of Stalingrad, that's the turning point of the Eastern Front, because that's kind of what they'd been told. I know, ex I still remember one question on my high school um, uh, social studies exam. Social studies is kind of this like amalgamation of uh, like economics and geography and history and political science and all this kind of stuff. But um, one question was, what were the turning points in World War II? And it was a 
multiple choice question and the quote unquote the right answer was Al Alamein, Stalingrad, and Dunkirk. Um, which I what? don't necessarily Dunkirk? agree with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that was that was the quote unquote right answer on this multiple choice exam, even though it, of course you can have vigorous debates about that and say, well, not so much. I mean, I don't know how I, I'm not super well read on, for example, the campaign in um um, North Africa and things like that, but I know Al Alamein by reputation, I've heard is kind of a turning point. I don't know what your take is on that. If it actually, if you would agree, or there's more. I'm assuming there's more probably context around that. But. I mean, my 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 basic view on Al Alamein or on the whole uh, North Africa campaign is that it, it lacked a whole coherent strategic concept and and proper aims and goals for that. So it was. It was uh, a waste of time anyway, because originally Rommel was sent there with a Panzersperrverband, a, a tank blocking detachment. In, I mean, that was the name um, the, in the original document. So to prevent the Italians from losing more because the, Hitler assumed that they would drop out of the war. So, and if this is the, your goal and then you drive up to Al Alamein, it's the question is, what the fuck are you doing here? That's not your job. <laughs> So and basically, but Rommel was successful in his in his first attacks, and I said, oh, let's go on, let's go on. Yeah, this is what you do in a computer game sometimes, and in a computer game sometimes it works, but there should have been a whole concept. But actually, back to Napoleon, from what I remember correctly, is the one major issue after the campaign in Russia was that Napoleon couldn't bring any more, uh, couldn't bring proper cavalry anymore because. Too much horses died, and also I think training of, of horsemen is all probably more complicated than infantry. And so at certain points, some historians argued that at least one or two battles after he won, he couldn't exploit this anymore because he couldn't send the cavalry afterward to destroy the enemy, the enemy armies anymore, which he had done beforehand. So you could say, okay, he, he lost on this uh, on this level the ability to exploit his victories and thus his tactical and battlefield prowess couldn't be exploited anymore after the battle, which of course to a longer degree leads to more attrition on his side. Because this was also a problem, for instance, for Frederick the Great, who figured Molwitz didn't exploit a certain victory, and then he had to fight the Austrians again and again and again. So in this case, you could argue that due to the lack of a certain capabilities like the lack of horses and cavalrymen, that in the long run the war of attrition switched more decisively or he couldn't get uh, basically a, a, a peace settlement because they say, okay we will drive you down completely because you're running out of any of it anyway oh that's very interesting and about El Alamein it's I think one reason why why El Alamein is often because it, it coincidences with the battle of Stalingrad so this is one of the reasons, but if you look at the overall numbers deployed there and everything, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's rather limited. It was basically, I mean, it, it was certainly, was it a shift in initiative rate? It, it's hard to tell because, I mean, Montgomery was, was methodically building up that he has enough troops and then he could push on and everything. So... So in, to a certain degree, you could say he delayed the initiative that he had probably gotten earlier. But I also have to read more up on this. But generally, um, I, I, I probably would have a hard time to say that the Battle of El Alamein, I think it more, it, it more made apparent what was already going on and not really a, a change. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a turning point. Unless you define turning point in a special way again. Yeah, yeah, and that's the so like that going back to that horribly flawed multiple choice question. It's like, you know that assumption that this is what it is is kind of a concept that I think a lot of people kind of have instilled in them, even though it is an extremely debatable concept. And of course, you can probably get more accurate when you're talking about turning points if you're talking about a very specific campaign like when you start zooming down you can start to see where things maybe start to shift yeah but then when you start to when you start talking about world war ii 
<laughs> suddenly that becomes way more complicated. Like, I don't know, is it, is it when uh, Japan declares war or attacks the Western allies and then when Hitler decla uh, declares war on the United States, is that a turning point? I mean, it could be. But then you're then you're getting into whole discussions of, well, they're already fighting the Soviet Union and he's already got his hand more than he bargained for uh, with the Soviet Union. So it's like, oh, uh, and every, <laughs> people start screaming and debating. And I, this is actually one. Um, once this ends up on on YouTube, I'd be interested to see uh, people maybe explain how they would maybe define a turning point or uh, pick a, maybe a specific turning point for a campaign or a war. It doesn't need to be World War II, but I mean, and then maybe in a paragraph, like just kind of briefly explain why you think that, like uh, argue it out a little bit. And I'd be interested to see like how people kind of um, conceptualize turning point. Yeah, it would be interesting. We could do a follow-up uh, podcast on this. It's so, so people, if you post it in the, in the script, uh, in the comments, and then Justin and I can go over your, your arguments and your viewpoints. And we see it. I mean, you could also on the, for, for instance, as you said, um, United States and Hitler declaring war on the United States. Another point could be, um, well, going from cash and carry to land lease could be also <clears throat> considered a turning point on the economic side or on the, on the longevity that the allies can bring to the table before the United States officially enters the war. Yeah, like there's, there's so like the possibilities are all, are almost endless, and I mean this is only one conflict, of course. I mean you can go back. Like I don't know that much about the course of the First World War, for example, but I'm sure there's probably some kind of uh, turning point debate. Although I'd be interested to see what the the um, literature kind of says about the First World War. I mean, if they maybe they've de-emphasized the concept of a turning point, just because the Western Front in the, in the First World War was so focused on attrition uh, to a point where maybe that didn't come up. Although there's, of course, great battles, and you could say, oh, I don't know, Verdun maybe or something. I don't know. I don't know what the state of the literature is, but it'd be interesting to see because World War II, I mean, it has, at least it has a, um, a conception of being a relatively, you know, relatively speaking, a war movement and, and decisive action and where you can start arguing about turning points probably more effectively than you can with, for example, something hazier and, and more protracted like uh, the Western Front in the First World War. I mean, but, there's the, the Eastern Front, you could say that there is, I think there's several turning points there probably because the, the battles there often were, I think, more decisive and, and more, more happened. Like Tannenberg is probably there and... And of course, then, then of course you, when the Russians drop argue, out of the war. You could also argue, of course, after Tannenberg, they fought for, what, another three years? So it's yeah, like... so... <laughs> yeah, the question is with, with what amount of troops and everything they had there, because uh, the, the, the majority was always on the, on, the, on the Western Front. It's quite interesting because I, I'm doing, I have done the script for the Stoßtrupp tactic, for Stormtrooper tactics, mm -hmm. and there's this misconception that the stormtrooper tactics were developed secretly in the East, yeah, and, and basically every literature is like, that's complete hogwash. They were always focused on, on the Western Front, and no, it was not developed on the Eastern Front in secret, and they always, if you look, they put the training there, they put the storm battalions there, and then said everyone, every army on the Western Front sent guys to the storm battalion for training so that we can train them in all the army, and... 1918 these these tactics which some consider elite actually had become a mainstay of the whole german army so it, it's very very inter i mean it's a really interesting topic because basically the tactics they developed there are still to a large degree the mainstay of modern infantry tactics it's it's pretty okay. insane i i saw um i saw um a, a squad a squad diagram or a squad illustration from a book from 1922 and it basically looks the same like the German infantry squad tactics of the Second World War. On, on this video, many, many soldiers, or at least the claimed they were soldiers, said, yeah, we still train this in, in our, our training nowadays. So basically nothing happened in, in this regard or, or very few, few changes happened there.
So, but but back to the turning point. I mean, could you could you? I mean, is this ever brought up a turning point on the economical side, on the industrial side? Because I, I think I never or don't don't do economic historians use this term at all? Was it too classy for them? I haven't seen it actually. Now that I think about it, I mean, I haven't read tons of economic histories of, and then the ones I do have um, are either sitting on my shelf or in a folder, and I haven't gotten to them yet. And I've like only you know kind of skim read them, but I haven't seen the term explicitly. It seems to be something that uh, typically, uh, in particular, operational military historians tend to talk about quite a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, on an operational scale, it makes sense. Mm. I would say on a tactical and operational scale, it makes sense. On a strategic, it gets a bit more complicated. On grand strategic, it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty uh, uh, adequate summary. I mean, for, for example, I mean, for people that um, are maybe confused by why we're even discussing this, I mean, even if you look just at the Eastern Front alone or the Great Patriotic War, as the victors named it, it's one of those weird cases where the losers got to name the... <laughs> The war in the in the uh, Western mind, but um, where you have someone that argues, uh, I've actually seen an argument for it's from a very old book uh, that um, aggression was the turning point. Which of course now I I don't think that holds any validity at all. I mean at that point it was the Red Army kind of just dick punching Army Group Center. It wasn't really a turning point. But and then you look at. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of arguments for Kursk, uh, which I've seen all the way up to pretty recent literature on Kursk. Uh, of course, there's still people that say Stalingrad, but that whole uh, that whole campaign. And then there's also people that now say Barbarossa. So for, I like actually quote from David um, uh, Stahel, uh, his book uh, Operation Barbarossa and Germany's Defeat. He's, he's done qu quite a few books um, on uh, Operation Barbarossa. And Typhoon, actually. But, um, uh, quote, Operation Barbarossa's much lauded success began as just another episode of Nazi propaganda. Yet this has been given uh, amazing longevity and even a guise of historical truth by continual acceptance in stoutly uncritical military histories. In spite of some severe early blows to the Red Army, the German army never really came close to their definitive goal of conquering the Soviet Union. Indeed, it was these early successes which led to the Wehrmacht's own rapid exhaustion and insurmountable difficulties. By mid-August 1941, it was already abundantly clear that Barbarossa would fall well short of achieving its operational objectives, while the ongoing scale of attrition would paradoxically transform its legacy from the annihilation of the Red Army to the ceaseless destruction of the German Wehrmacht. While the precise path to Allied victory was by no means clear in late August 1941, Germany's inability to win the war was at least assured, which is a pretty... I've already probably... He's already probably triggered people this point. Accordingly, if on 22nd June 1941, Hitler was right and the world did indeed collectively hold its breath, the course of operations ensured that by the middle of August, the world would, uh, the world could breathe again, end quote. So if there's, there's one argument that Barbarossa was basically turning point of the Eastern Front. And of course, there's probably going to be people, and I'm sure, I mean, if you for example, if you want to argue Stalingrad or something like that, I mean, maybe this argument does not convince you. I mean, he's written a whole book on it where, honestly, I'm convinced by it. But then there's other serious, there's, you know, very serious military historians that study the Eastern Front who don't necessarily agree with him. So there's still discourse. I mean, here, here is the discourse because I, I read quite a bit on this and, and I'm, I, it's, a, it's a back and forth and... And what I think is to a certain degree one aspect for a very long time and still a lot of people believe that Barbarossa was, was, was basically a success until winter. So mm -hmm. this is to a certain degree basically Nazi propaganda and not up to scratch for the most part because if you look at the substantial losses they sustained, sustained. Yet, so this is, so they are trying to... So for, for my point of view is they okay, they're, they're trying to make a point, so they drive it home a bit further. And this is one of the reasons why probably it's okay, let's say Barbarossa is the turning point. The the German and also the basically the the Deutsche Reich and the Zweite Weltkrieg is, is written under the same premise to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. 
And if you have this premise, you will find every argument that sustains the premise. So, but at, at the same point, if you look at, at this as, okay, it was completely unwinnable at this point. Okay, why the heck did it take four more years for the Soviets, including the United States and Great Britain and the Commonwealth forces to drive down Germany? Mm -hmm. And, and one, one aspect, of course, you can look at all the numbers and you say, yeah, okay. But if you look only at the numbers, then you look at the French army in, in spring 1940 and at the German army in spring 1940, and then you would say, yeah, this is going to be a bloody stalemate for several years like it was in 1914 to 1918. So this is the, this is the, the thing because you, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know. And the question is, if anybody knows, because this comes down to psychology, what would have been if... For instance, I don't know if Stalin would have said, okay, that's enough, or, or I don't know, or there's, a, or there's a cue against him, or something else. Or if, for instance, they go for Leningrad and completely encircle it and don't make this semi-encirclement and, and kick it completely out of the war. And some other aspect that shifts the psychological side and then they con con converse their forces better. So, so this is the, to a certain degree, the, the hard part because, yeah, I mean, they, they were fighting on extremely long and, and still gaining successes. Of course, you can look at the, at the long duration. If you look at Barbarossa, the, the offensive was on the whole front line. It was from, from the Baltic Sea down to the, to the Black Sea, basically. I mean, they reached the Black Sea, yeah. Then... Suddenly, or suddenly, in 1942, Case Blue, it's only Harris Group Sud. It's only in the southern sector. So I don't know the exact length, but it was probably only a third or even less. And then you look at 1943 and it's, it's Kursk. It's basically a small spot in, in the vastness of the Eastern Front. So here you can see a clear process going on that the Germans are losing. But you have the same problem already if you look in November 1941, there was this uh, conference at Orsha, as far as I remember. And basically, all frontline commanders, every frontline commander says, we can't go on further. But the Army High Command says, okay, one final offensive, and then they launch Typhoon, or they continue Typhoon. And this is in, in contrast to the Dunkirk Hawk, where basically the frontline commanders say, hey, let's, let's push on. And also some of the army high command and Hitler and Rundstedt and some others are saying, no, no, um, we need to stop here. And, and basically when all frontline commanders said, okay, we need to stop here, what, what would have happened if they had stopped here and dug in? Because the Russian counterattack in 1941 was way too ambitious. They attacked on the whole broad front. But if the Germans had time, I think, I think it was basically on the 4th of December the Germans stopped or on the 5th and the counterattack basically started one day afterwards, the Soviet counteroffensive. So I, I'm not sure what if the, the Germans had the chance to dig in in November already, regain some of the strengths, less exhausted soldiers, but because you should not forget, this is one more, or not one more, but yeah, almost three weeks more fighting, which the soldiers probably could have spent in rest or in more rest if they hadn't continued the offensive. And what happens if the counteroffensive, for instance, in 1941, basically is a complete failure or, or has far less success than it had? Would have that turned, um, uh, would that have a different psychological impact on the forces or somebody else? Or maybe to a certain degree, okay, I, I, guess, I guess the Japanese wouldn't have intervened at all against the Soviets, but so, this, this is, for, for instance, for me, so there are many decisions and many aspects to, to say Barbarossa was always a complete failure. It's, yeah, if you look for that, you will find it. There, there, there's a certain degree of distance needed to say, okay, let's consider this under... Without the, the old narrative, the Barbarossa was almost a success. Let's start mm -hmm. from the very scratch. Mm 
let's assume there are no wearables, let's assume there are no Nazis, let's assume they are just like, okay, let's get all the facts together and, and, and look at the situation. The problem is, of course, we also have limited access to Russian archives again. So we don't really know what was going on there as well. And the same thing is, of course, the archives don't tell you too much about the psychological situation in the leadership. So this is one of the reasons why I'm to a certain degree, I think I started a few months ago, like it was Barbarossa. It's, I don't know, it's, it's too much like, okay, it was obviously going to fail. So I'm like, I mean, if, especially if you consider the whole land lease aspect, because I, I had recently a talk with Shian Greco, the author of Hell to Pay, and he told me what what for for the attack against um, Manchuria, what the U.S. provided to the to the to the Soviets. It was an insane amount of stuff. It was oh wow. It was I th- I think it was forty thousand trucks. And 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 I don't know what what else. It was like okay, so what what happens? With, with the whole land lease aspect as well because yeah it's it actually reminds me just a, as a random tangent um there's apparently a memoir written by a uh, russian tanker who wasn't uh, he was actually a sherman tanker uh, and he wrote a memoir and i'm trying to remember the name of it i can't even remember if it's actually in english or not it might only be in russian just as a random uh if somebody in the comments remembers what the name of that is or knows what i'm talking about um please leave a comment because then it's bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's so I, I was always subscribing to the narrative at one point that Barbarossa basically meant okay, the war is lost for Germany. But mm-hmm. the if you look at how long it still went on, of course, I mean, I mean, one argument you can, could make is what I made. Originally, which I stated beforehand, if you look at the at the the ability of the divisions, of the number of uh, divisions fully capable of doing offensive operations, if you look at that, it's it, it's pretty staggering. But because this is what some people don't realize, what in Barbarossa died were the crack elite troops of the Germans. Those were the best veterans, and the the combat troops die first. So even if you have only 10, 20, or 30 percent losses. Those are from the first line troops usually. These are not the mm. cooks. This is not the clerk in the staff office. Uh, in, the, in the staff office. This is, these, these are the, the infantrymen, the, the guys driving the Sturmgeschütze and everything else. So you're, you're not losing 10 percent, you're losing 10 percent of your combat troops, of your elite combat troops. So replacing them is a bit tougher, especially for Germany, that puts a lot of effort on training and everything else. So, yeah, that's an interesting point, because um, David Stahel, I think, um, it's been years since I read his book, but he makes the point that in Barbarossa, disproportionately, the, amount of the fighting was sustained primarily by the elite panzer forces, not even necessarily the infantry division. So you had a fraction of the combat troops sustaining some, like, the majority of the fighting and dying, of course, by extension. And this kind of bleeds into something else um, Satino argues in his uh, soon-to-be three books, I think. Uh, I can't remember which book specifically, if it's the one for 42 or 43. But he talks about um, the the demotorization of Wehrmacht. So he, he kind of looks at, like, how... The, the war, the attrition sustained in the war kind of starts to almost de-evolve the, the Wehrmacht in its ability to maneuver. Yeah, yeah, they, they, of, they pull uh, out the trucks of the, of the regular infantry divisions, basically. So, yeah, and, and replace them with horse well, One thing you could argue, actually, going back to Stalingrad, which was the chopping around, that what at Stalingrad happened is a, a huge psychological impact because... Uh, a complete army was encircled and usually this is what the Germans do with, with the Soviets. And the other aspect is that everyone basically was lost there because they lost all the officers, all the NCOs and all the enlisted men. I mean, the, the losses, so, so you 
there was a lack in transfer of knowledge, something which doesn't happen so much even if you lose a battle or sustain a large amount of casualties. There's still some elements, skeletons basically coming back from which you can build your units and can also gain the experience in something else. And also, for instance, even if they retreat or the trucks and I think all the horses, so they lost a lot of stuff there. Similar, you could say, to Napoleon. So, although I think the horses were actually outside of the encirclement area, I read it recently. So, still, but they, they lose every truck, every half track, every tank, everything that was in there, every rifle. And for this, you could say, okay, this was a major turning point because it was made another nail in the coffin because after Barbarossa it has sustained already very large losses to the combat troops and then they sustained another one to the core or the backbone like the N then the NCOs and everyone else. Yeah, I think we've uh, pretty at least uh, opened the book on this debate and maybe got some people thinking. So yeah, if you want to like, because obviously, if you haven't gotten the impression already from our, what is it, about almost like, what, 40 minutes or something like that of yeah, talking 48. about something that, yeah, this is talking about something that, I mean, may, maybe many of you thought was a fairly concrete concept, but at least we've maybe problematized it uh, a little bit, like, made you think, um, like to hear maybe your opinions and, and thoughts, because this is something where it's not even so much, you know, it's like, it, it really is a discussion, I mean, even among professional historians, like what the value of talking about turning points is, um, or turning points for certain wars, or campaigns, or all sorts of stuff. So it's it's something where I'd like to actually um, see other people's thoughts. So. Yeah, I'm also very interested in this, so please let, let us know in the comment section, and we will discuss them in a follow-up podcast, which should be quite entertaining, I hope. So thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, always glad to be on here. And if you like the podcast, consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Bye.